Happy Monday, everybody. There's Yo. a title on uh, Drudge Reports is Paul, Ukrainian people, sexiest people in the world. And, oh, it's like, you know, byline, Ukrainian today <laughs> survey <laughs> of Ukraine says. <laughs> Not what it said, but that would be kind of funny. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You should have self confidence, Ukraine. Go, you, you do it, girl. You go, Crane. You go, Crane. <laughs> Happy Monday, everybody. Doing weird things here. Yeah. How's everyone feeling? Justin, you feeling good? I'm feeling good. It, 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 it's 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 July first, or as uh, we will all eventually know it, the day that all the brands change their rainbow logos back. <laughs> I mean, I was really excited to see everybody honoring Doug Henning like that, though. It really <laughs> was touching. The legend. Absolute legend. Uh, and uh, was it like in the last day, little Nas X poked his head out of the closet? <laughs> yes. And yeah. that meant uh, three months more pride. We <laughs> saw his shadow. And that means we get three months more. It's interesting because I think it was... Um... I mean, not even an open secret. I think it was just a known thing because he used to be. Uh, he used to run a Nicki Minaj fan account. Yeah, <laughs> like you know, that was. Let's that not was, jump to conclusions there. There's a lot of reasonable reasons you could do that. You know? Sure. Well, exactly. no, but I, I'm saying is, uh, as a, as a part of having run that account, I think he was, out. Yeah, he was saying he was a gay guy when he was running that. Although apparently he also said some other stuff that he does. Well, he, he denies the account though, doesn't he? Say what? He denies, yeah, I mean, Is but he? there's, I don't know, there, 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 there's some screen grabs floating around. Uh, oh, I thought it eh. seemed to make clear. I'm, I'm going to deny it all he wants. It's life known. for a 20 year old. Very full active life for a 20 year old. Yeah. Uh, no, and, 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 and the EP was good. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't bad. It was certainly something that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think you can, uh, I, I look forward to him, you know, having more than a month, month and a half to make something. Yeah. You know, Brian, do you know who Lil Nas X is? Uh, no. I assume a musician of some sort. Oh, okay. Well, you're busy. Well, you, uh, you, you've probably heard of, of the Old Town Road song. Oh, sure, sure, sure. That's the guy? That's Yeah, that's it. Got it. Yeah. Oh. Didn't they use that in the... Rosh was pointing out that was like in the Rambo Last Blood trailer. Yeah, it was. Really? Oh, why? Weird. That seems like a weird... Because it's I guess like the most popular song of the year. Like, yeah. there's no if there's a bigger song this year, it will it will be gigantic, considering yeah. how what a supernova that was. I love I love there was a Billboard headline, uh, Lil Nas X's Old Town Road stops Taylor Swift from hitting number one a second time. <laughs> He's a scourge, scourge, Lil Nas X. No, I think justice. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, so you are. I, uh, I'm not a Taylor Swift. Big, fan. A lot, a lot of Taylor Swift drama. That's right. Yesterday. Oh God, yeah. I didn't. Even, I could only understand about half of that stuff. But. Yeah. Uh, stop me if you heard it. A popular recording artist upset with record label. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it made it sound like they someone bought her record deal or record label. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, it, yeah, basically it's it, uh, uh, she, I guess the background is she hates Justin Bieber's manager and Justin Bieber's manager hates her and they've had a very antagonistic relationship and then she was not offered the chance to buy her old record label that she had just bought or at least buy her master tapes. Mm. Uh, the record label sold to Justin Bieber's manager and so she was like, oh, he's bullied me and you know brought back up the whole Kim and Kanye thing, like mm -hmm. uh, that. It's it's been a, a a thing. I don't know. Whatever. Taylor Swift is upset, and somebody needs to go console her. Yeah. Especially really, really rich people. Tears. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all, but it's also one of those things where it's like, and, and. Well, yeah, that was coming out. I was talking to Rock coming out last night, and I was like, I'm like. Somebody bought a thing. Somebody just said they bought the thing. They're already rich. Everybody's rich. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to lose any sleep. I, ah, I can't believe that poor Taylor Swift didn't get the catalog. Mm -hmm. I, I have no problem. I like her music, actually. But I was like, mm -hmm. it's just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, Taylor Swift. But to quote Paul McCartney, Michael Jackson bought what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
All right, I think I'm good to go here on my side if you guys are ready. Yep. Yeah. All right, then take it away in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. Brian Brushwood. Well, howdy. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, that's me. Hey, gentlemen, did you get the news? Did you get the news? Uh, uh no, that he is risen. <laughs> you know what? Kind of close to it. Uh, apparently, somebody at NASA saw Infinity War and got really, really, really angry at Thanos and didn't make it to the theaters to see Endgame. Mm-hmm. You're like, what? Where is this going, Andrew? We're going to Titan. Wait, uh, uh, Astra, uh, 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 NASA is? NASA's sending a probe to Titan. They want to send a hover, like a, a drone-like probe, to fly around and examine the surface of Titan with a nuclear-powered quadcopter. So uh, Titan has Thanos. incredible uh, air density, right? Like like uh, air pressure is almost like uh, like Earth. So, so mm-hmm. just a couple of propellers should be just fine. And yeah, it's mm-hmm. all methane. But there's no oxygen to make a, a explosion with, so basically just flying around in a methane atmosphere. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's some concept illustrations there, but it's a really cool mission because Titan is fascinating. Titan's got this, you know, this icy surface, but probably there's a big thick ocean below it. And if we're looking for places in the solar system where you could find life, well, I, I, I thought they had full on rain. They had methane rain, like uh, it makes methane clouds in the they meth- got methane, methane clouds. Rain. They got pools of hydrocarbons. I mean, lakes. It's like yeah, uh, if it, man. That's the crazy part. You look at the what few photographs we have of Titan, and uh, the, it definitely looks just straight up like a like a I don't know a Earth river beds and and valleys and all that stuff. But very yellow. Looks like Beijing. Actually, now I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Bryce, if you pull up the uh, the list of the instruments there you had before, we can see what's going to be on board there. This is a list of, you know, anyone read that out, what we're going to be measuring there. So the spacecraft is about 450 kilograms. It includes a mask spectrometer, a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, a geophysics and meteorology package, and a camera suite, including microscopic and panoramic cameras. So... Pretty cool. So this thing will apparently be able to like fly around. I don't know. I believe it will. How how land, long do they think too. it'll go for? Couple, I think a couple of years. It's got that nuclear battery, so I think it's going to pick up, go from location to location, and land, and then make, take instruments and pick up. And it's just a great way, you know, with Mars because we actually have a Mars helicopter in development because. Paradoxically, as it sounds, that because there's thin air, you'd think that like propellers and stuff wouldn't work. But because there's little air resistance, they can act, they have to go much much faster. But you could get certain things that you know would you know that you wouldn't likely think would work to work there because the thin atmosphere with the lower gravity on Mars makes that possible. And here on Titan, as you pointed out, Brian, with with that thick atmosphere, comparatively so, you know, I think at the surface of Titan. If you had like a breathing mask and maybe like kind of just a chemical suit, you could probably the air pressure would be fine. You could probably walk around. Wow, uh, might be cold, but um, very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah, well, and the idea of just like, you know, we're we're accustomed to probes moving at a couple miles an hour tops, but the idea that we could just fly around dynamically and just be like, eh, go take a tour, and then just, I mean, can you think about the level of, of quality of video we're, we're gonna get, it's unprecedented. We, 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 when this happens, we will have never seen anything like it before. Yeah, there's a video, I just see, if I, you do Titan mission as a search, you can see there's a concept video showing the, the rotorcraft landing and popping around there. Um, the plan is to launch this thing, um, Somewhere between between 2020 and 2029, that's proposed, and then orbital insertion between 2029 and 2038. Okay, yeah, so so 38 would be d- dependent on it not taking off. Uh, yeah, 2038, right. it can come, and you know Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk's colony can wave to it as it lands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're watching this thing, the, the the simulation of this thing flying across the 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 you know the Titan, and then it's landing, and you know, and it it looks like the Sahara Desert right now from the uh, the the look of things. And you know what what, what what's amazing is how normal that quadcopter design kind of looks now. 
in mm-hmm. a way that it probably would have looked very, very futuristic, not but like 10 years ago. But now there's so many commercial drones out there. and we're, we're so used to what that looks like that that's like, oh, yeah, no, that makes all the sense in the world that that's the, the, the way that we go with it. There's, you know, the thing we get excited about some idea of the future. And then when we get it, we've had incremental versions of it. By the time we get it, we're like, oh, yeah, it's like when you the iPhone's amazing. But you had nokia's and other cool mm-hmm. smartphones that were part of the picture you had going from the brick phone to the star tack and then with the bigger display you know you're kind of you're, you're sort of prepped for these things and with like quadcopters like when we start seeing flying taxis you know using rotor craft or ones that might start using ducted fans that look like things out of blade runner by the time we get to those we're like well yeah it's just a version of this yeah it's just a version of that and a version of that it, then, it's, it's just a quieter more uh, uh, energy efficient version of this thing that the solution that we've had and we've been iterating on for years and years and years yeah i mean it's still though like it's amazing to watch like a harrier take off a harrier jet oh god yeah you know um and that ultimately was a direction that we we didn't pursue as much as vertical takeoff and landing it wasn't because we didn't know how it's just fuel efficiency it was just so expensive to try to just take off without using aerodynamic lift Speaking of which, I uh, there was an article in uh, The Economist talking about the possibility of not so much battery-powered aircraft, but hybrid aircraft. That hmm. uh, So, uh, as I understand it, a turboprop airplane is uh, basically a jet engine that spins a blade, and uh, you can use the jet fuel to take off, but then once you take off, you don't need quite so much power, and so you can switch to sort of battery mode. And then uh, uh, when you come in for a landing, you, uh, you, you, you actually, just like braking, recharges your battery in your Prius, coming in for a landing, you would recharge the battery for your next takeoff, which is uh, kind of crazy. Yeah, that's a very, a lot of things going on there, but, you know, a you know, modern hybrid car has a lot of things going on that 30 years ago we'd be like, you know, like I, I had to rent a truck to go move a piece of uh, equipment, and... Uh, Regular truck, but it had the engine that shut off at you know go to traffic lights. I mean, intentionally, not like my car in high school. And you know, and I and I was thinking about like, man, like we've come so far with starters and stuff, where it's the you know we took hybrid technology. Said, yeah, well, let's just have the engine you know just shut down when we get to a stop if it stops for more than ten seconds, because we'll can you know we'll save energy. Where thirty years ago you wouldn't have done that because like the amount of energy to get it started again would have been you know a lot. But now the parts are smaller, things are more efficient. So. Yeah, the you know. uh, the claim is 30% fuel savings. Uh, I think it does limit the passenger side. I think you can only get around 50 seats on it because mm-hmm. of uh, that, that type of technology. But, uh, I mean, all that seems like a, a step in the right direction. Yeah. Very cool. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I was yelling. Oh, God. Ah. Oh. We launched another Falcon Heavy last week, <laughs> which is the, the that's the SpaceX rocket where they take a Falcon 9 and they strap two other Falcon 9 rockets to it. And this was a very, very fast paced, very high powered uh, takeoff. And uh, they were able to the first two boosters landed back at Cape Canaveral. The center booster had to go something like 3000, 2000 miles out into the ocean and missed Coming in, it was coming in faster and hotter than they've ever had one come back in before. So it missed the barge by that much and went into the ocean. So it wasn't really like, ah, oh, a loss. It was more like, all right, we need to pay attention to that now. But what was cool was, remember how we talked about SpaceX was trying to uh, capture the fairing? That's the yeah. big shell that goes over. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the fairing, um, it, 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 they had the crazy contract because basically just falls down and you can't strap rockets to it. There's no fuel in it. You just gotta, you just gotta try to catch it. And and so yeah, they, they put they a got... parasail on it. They put a parasail on it so it'll sort of guide itself a bit. And right. uh, they they you know they've been using they've been sending out when they can launches one ship with basically a giant acrobatic net out there. And they've been trying for years to catch the fairings. <laughs> just trying to catch one fairy. Just to, no one. Just proof of concept. Can we catch one? Because each one of those is worth like three million dollars because the, you know, how big it is so and that's six million dollars is over 10 percent now of the launch cost they caught one they caught half of a fairing so here's a weird question let's project 10 20 30 years into the future where there are so many launches is there a point at which it no longer 
makes sense for SpaceX themselves to be taking on uh, or or to, to uh, like I'm wondering if there's a time where they just announce a schedule and privateers run around and just try to capture for bounties. Like they're like, hey man, we, uh, we don't want to do all this ourselves. We'll pay we'll pay five hundred thousand dollar bounty to anyone who catches one. Here's our launch schedule. We're launching so many times. I guess there's never a point where that makes sense because it's always going to be cheaper once they perfect the technology for them to catch it themselves. Well, and you don't want ships colliding with each other trying to get it. You need you have telemetry. You have all these other things going, on, and you have proprietary technologies on board. You don't want that. That okay. I, I guess yes, Andrew. All of that is absolutely true. But what Brian is desperately trying to get to, no matter how thin the logic, is something I agree very deeply with, which is that just a wild, it's a mad, mad, mad world style. People just semi pirates collecting. I mean, that's that's. I I, I think that would be a tremendous set piece for a movie, right? Like like what a what a world <laughs> right. where where you got this kind of Mad Max and you know you're 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 catching sky jewels now, basically. Now maybe not SpaceX, right? But but uh, and, and who well, knows? In, 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 could, some, in some world where everything is so commoditized and there's a million different people kind yeah. of doing this, then, then who could, knows? You could replace that scenario with some satellites, and this is one of the things that spy satellites would do, is they would use back in the day before it was possible to do really good digital transmission of, of images, is they would have canisters that would eject. And a canister would go into the Earth's atmosphere, right? And then it would have a you know have a little heat shield and small things, and they would have a parachute, and they would try to capture it from midair with an airplane, right? Because this is how they got you know the film back from these spy satellites. I could see when you start getting a lot more satellites up there and whatnot that you know if you want to do experiments and oh shoot our thing just landed in the Congo, you know, yeah, I need to hire a, a group of Austin Mavericks to go out there and uh, capture <laughs> this thing for us. That's pretty good. I can also imagine. You could use the cover of a podcast to do it. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if there could be a story where you know, just as uh, you know, we did an episode uh, that'll be coming up soon on the Modern Rogue about shortwave radio and uh, how you have this finite resource uh, uh, in the you know the bandwidth spectrum, and so there are certain areas that are carved out for special areas or special uses, but others that are kind of like a free for all. What if you had a story that took place in the in the far far enough future that there essentially was uh, the same story with orbits? Like there was a free for all orbit that was low enough that even if you know your your crap smashed into another crap, uh, it would just immediately fall down and uh, evaporate. But then but then maybe maybe that's the story is that all those people are spending money not not big money but big enough that when their satellites go down, they're hardened enough that the data, the science, the, the experiment is still in there. And, and so you have uh, wild, wild uh, bounty chasers running around trying to, to get the goods before the other guy. I don't know. There's, there's something on. to that. I'm sorry, Brian. I, I didn't hear you. I'm in the middle of writing my new novel, uh, Star <laughs> Chasers. Um, didn't hear any of what you said. Let's go to the next topic. Uh, um, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, we saw an American company which used an Indian satellite, com you know, Indian space agency to launch something against FCC recommendations and that. I think that the problem we have right now is that SpaceX has lowered the cost of launch, right? Like they look at the cost have gone down, reusability is now factored into the price. Everybody else is scrambling, but it's not like industry has started to really catch on and say, man, we need to be doing more stuff in space. We need to be doing materials research. We should be doing this. It's like, it's like internet availability, you know, in the early, you know, the late 80s or, you know, the World Wide Web in the early 90s. Like, oh, that's a cool thing. Maybe someday somebody will make use of it, you know, and it's like, uh, yeah, and, you know, 10 years, 15 years from now, you're going to look back and go, man, why don't we get into this sooner? But right now, there's not enough people trying to do that at the time. It's smaller in startups there are, a lot of cool startups. So, well, and I wonder how many people are already thinking. 20 to 40 years ahead like Netflix did. I mean, at a time that most people were on dial-up, Netflix, they didn't name their company DVDs by mail, even though that's what their actual product was. They named it Netflix because they they knew, even then, the dream that they were aiming for. Eventually, you know, bandwidth will be ubiquitous and fast, and when it does, we will be well-positioned to take over all of the entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, it just comes comes down to how much money. I the the cool thing is between Firefly Systems and a lot of these other companies trying to develop cheaper launch systems is you can start to get more exploratory R and D budgets. Like you can't do you can't do a space mission right now. Most companies or pharmaceuticals couldn't do one with their their regular R you know like a small part of their R and D budget. You know, but as these costs fall down to a couple hundred thousand dollars or a few million dollars to do this sort of stuff you might see people thinking that more forward. You know, that's what's exciting, you know. Yeah. You know, this is exciting. It's what? keeping us on the air. Oh, hell yeah, Andrew. Patreon.com slash weird things where you go if you're a weird things aficionado, a weird things fan, a weird things supporter, you want to keep this program rolling, then head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash weird things. That is... That's where you can uh, uh, kick us a little scratch, make sure that we keep rolling here on the show. And also you get our show After Things, which happens after Weird Things, a little earlier than everybody else. Folks, it keeps us doing this show. I'll tell you what, I blew out my voice over the weekend. In another world, would I say, hey, I should save my voice? Maybe, but not because... Uh, not not when there's a Patreon.com slash weird things. Me and my little money grubbing fingers needs to get every <laughs> single penny I can. And I crawl out and croak my way through this episode for you folks. I'm glad you enjoy it. Patreon.com slash weird things. Um, I sent a link over to Bryce. I'm going to ask you a question. So right now, if we wanted to take this show, this 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 like an hour of audio and compress it about how what would the file size be? Uh, an hour of audio compressed, what, about three, no, uh, what, 10 megabytes or so? Uh, five megabytes? It depends on the quality. If, if you just wanted to barely hear, I think we could get it down to three megabytes if, if you just needed, like, less than AM quality. Bryce, what's your take on that? Uh, I'm actually going to try to download one of our episodes here and see what it is. But we, we down convert to, uh, uh, I want to say, 96 kilobit per second. Just because uh, we sometimes can go up to like an hour and a half, so we, we get mm -hmm. it pretty small. Uh, for example, After Things last week, which I think was less than an hour, was 27 megabytes. Yep. So, and, and we're seeing here, like B5 says, that MP3, 128 kilobits per second is about one meg per minute. And there's some better compression schemes out there, like uh, AUG has Opus and some of the variants on that and some other stuff. So... Um, super, super heavily compressed is like Brian pointed out. Like, yeah, you, you start getting like five megabytes. What if we could have a really good quality version of this show, an hour that we could fit on one floppy disk? W one, one megabyte? megabyte? One megabyte. Wow. wow. Uh, a floppy disk, Bryce, used to be a form I, of storage. I grew yeah. up with, oh, I, had okay. floppy, okay. I had the big right, floppy right, disk, right. I had the thing you shoot. <laughs> you click it in, you lock it in, you could, if you Bryce, could remember like, how to play Jeopardy. These, which my mom put under our soft drinks when we started trying to set them on the counter. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about one megabyte? Any that takers? Any takers? I mean, that's that's extraordinary. What, what level of quality are we talking about? Oh, uh... Bryce, did you get the the example I sent? I do. This is the Codec Two. So so, uh, pretty damn good quality is the answer, Brian. And the way the answer is because of machine learning and artificial intelligence. What some people have done is they've taken they've taken a a standard Codec Two, which is a, a pretty good codec for you know co you know for compressing audio like human speech. You compress it, and if you just listen to the Codec Two, you're like. So Brian Bressler decided to look, and you're like, well, that sounds like old-timey radio and not that good. Right. But by then putting it through WaveNet, which is the same technology they use for speech synthesis and for artificial intelligence to figure out how to turn text into speech, it can take that, that in modifications, of course, they can take that and reconstruct it and fill in all those little bits of the human, basically... If you want to play some examples, yeah. So it here won't we've got... sound like anything to our listeners. <laughs> so yeah, that's here. So we've got the original file here. This is a sample. Separately, New York State sold about seventy-seven point one million dollars of certificates of participation. Okay, so you can kind of hear it's a little. It, it it almost sounds like it's already been compressed. And maybe it's not yeah. perfect microphone. Here's Codec Two. Separately, New York State sold about seventy-seven point one million dollars of certificates of participation. So it's like speak and spell, basically. Yeah, and yeah. that's the super compressed version. And now they're going to use the WaveNet. To, they're going to take that actual file and use the WaveNet decoder. Right. This is a decoder, not an encoder. Yep. 
Separately, New York State sold about $77.1 million of certificates of participation. Holy cow. And you, it sounds cleaner. You, you know what's amazing is I'll bet, imagine we get to a place where uh, there's sort of a checksum for a person's cadence, voice, facial structure, and linguistic patterns. Then all you would need to do is send over that sort of checksum and then the actual text of it with time codes of which words are said when, and then all of a sudden you could get even smaller when a machine learning just says, do the Brian Brushwood voice, use the Brian Brushwood library, imagine Brian Brushwood says this, and then it just ends up sounding exactly the same. Well, yeah, here, remember with text, you might lose intonation and certain other things, but with like a version of this, though, you're getting the you're getting so much data from there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, play the female voice because I thought that was even better. Sure. Uh, here's, but here's... And again, the the third version we hear is taking that second. It's the same audio as the second version and just going back and saying, this is how I think it's supposed to sound. Sure. So here's the original female example. Under terms previously reported, the Italian agricultural concern assumed about $195 million in subordinated debt as part of the transaction. All right. Here's the Codec 2 version. Under terms previously reported, the Italian agricultural concern assumed about $195 million in subordinated debt as part of the transaction. And with the WaveNet decoder. Under terms previously reported, the Italian agricultural concern assumed about $195 million in subordinated debt as part of the transaction. You know, th this technology is amazing. I just personally wish they wouldn't have picked such racy examples. For that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for you, Andrew. So the, the trade-off you have when you have higher compression, and you see this more in, in video because video has even higher bit rates and, and much more stringent compression. Um, is that you? It requires a lot more processing power to mm -hmm. decode it, and so with this WaveNet decoder, w if it's so compressed here, and it sounds like the WaveNet decoder is actually synthesizing new data out of it, mm -hmm. uh, would this like what what is it something where you need a bunch of extra processing power to decode this? It, it is going to be more processing power intensive than other codecs, and that's one of the things that we try to do with codecs now is we try to make them, you know, very efficient. The right. stuff that runs, remember, everything we use, everything, our voices right now, everything we do across the internet involving voice, almost images and every video is compressed. And then with mobile, we've been putting this sort of like we've got to make these things faster, mm -hmm. yet not burn up a ton, ton of energy. So that'll be the next phase is to make them more efficient. But one of the beautiful things that happens with machine learning is that, you eventually develop algorithms to get better and better at it. I think we talked about, or I don't know if we talked about this. There's, uh, you know, there's a physicists have been using an, uh, a machine learning system to recreate like the universe. You know, basically like the physics and the placement of things around there. And by machine learning, by putting in a bunch of inputs, this is what the data is. This is what these things usually end up looking like. Figure out the fastest way to process it. They've developed a system that's far less processor intensive than conventional ways. Mm -hmm. So with machine learning codecs, and, and we'll get to me, and this isn't machine learning encoding, as you pointed out, Bryce, but when we start getting into the more advanced versions of that, they'll get efficient. And it's been pointed out in, you know, the you know, the you know, the criticism pointed out in our chat room here is it's like, you know, this is for voice only. And that that's true. Like yeah. if you tried to put, you know, a song through there, it'll sound like it'll sound like garbage. It's not what it's tuned for, but We've come a long way. Do you remember, like, the first, the MP3 codec was created by a guy, you know, listening to Susan Vegas, I'm sitting in the corner, Tom tweaking Steiner? the math by hand, back and forth, until he said, yep, good enough. And that became the standard for billions of downloads, because wow. one guy, you know, going over. So, now that we're using AI and machine learning to do these things, expect to see, uh really good ones for music and other stuff and you know extremely small and you know and it's not like we're sitting there going oh yeah because you know transmitting voice is still a problem but mm -hmm. as you start to see things like google stadia or you're playing video games and start to play vr and this stuff and you want to compress and send really complicated experiences across the inner tubes these will help Dude, that's that's remarkable, and it's it's interesting because in an age where uh, bandwidth keeps getting faster and faster, 
uh, we could afford to be a little bit bloated and just, you know, run stuff less mm-hmm. and less compressed. But uh, I wonder if, you know, as, as Moore's Law is not going to stop and all of a sudden processing power just gets stronger and stronger in your phone, it's going to be like uh, it's going to be faster and faster. There's um, uh, a device called a, we've talked about it before called a Winston that basically acts as a, uh, a relaying bridge uh, between your router and your uh, cable modem. And by virtue of cutting out so much of the advertising stuff, websites, even though it's technically slower because it takes more hops and processing time, it cuts out so much of the advertising and tracking garbage that websites uh, allegedly actually load even faster. And so, uh, you know, up to 30% faster. So if this is the case, we could do the same thing with a bunch of other data points uh, over mobile. It seems like Mm -hmm. a great idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's, is we're, you know the the thing that struck me about the Google Google doing their Stadia, which is for those of you who don't know, that's the their video game uh, platform coming out, where basically they're going to stream the video game pl- system itself. The console will be a Google server somewhere sending you the video, video, <laughs> and then your controller is going to be sending your position, you know, what you're moving back and forth to it, your position stuff like this, and and I think it's think certain things are happening locally, but the real things happening remotely. But like, you know, when you want to get into 4K, 8K games and H, you know, super high res VR and stuff like this, and you want to do that remotely on a cloud server, that's a lot of bandwidth. Yeah, but, you're not kidding. You know, these compression things make that easier. Um, so it's a it's a very 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 interesting future i've been listening to an audiobook which will probably be my pick when i finish it but is the how the internet happened mm-hmm. and a really really great overview of a lot of things you know to basically you know from netscape to uh napster to netflix well i mean other things that don't begin within but um it's a very very wide you know story of like this the technologies that you know made things happen and a lot of things that kind of stories is sort of like forgot but like you know last night brian they were talking about the whole you know reed hastings like well, we didn't call it netflix because it was dvds by mail you know and cool stories uh, i got one more cool story for you here and this is another again it, it's a little bit machine learning you know heavy today but there's just so much stuff happening in this world of of you know developments happening at a pretty rapid pace like last week there were several stories like facebook improved the algorithms they were using to reconstruct your face so when you have virtual avatars which uh that looked really cool but this was one that i thought was kind of the neatest one other than that voice compression thing which i thought was a pretty cool is uh we've talked about using uh we've talked about gans before those are what we call generative adversarial networks where basically one algorithm one you know one system is saying um uh, I can detect faces, and the other algorithm saying like I can generate random noise, but learn to make faces and test me. And they test each other until the face generator gets really good at making faces. It can fool the face detection system or anything else you want to do. Microsoft unveiled a new system or uh, revealed uh, researchers at Microsoft and JD AI Labs object-driven attention generative adversarial networks. You know that one, and what it is is they took a system remember how they could like you know take photos and say hey this is like a dog catching a frisbee right and it would you look at the photo and identify that now they've done it in reverse now you, you just, just say, you just say show me a dog throwing a uh, biting a frisbee and it generates you know it, it is never it maybe you could say dog catching you know a cat in midair and it's never seen that thing happen before yet it figures out this is what this should probably look like and it can do pretty cool job of generating these images. Man, wasn't there another thing like six, eight months ago where you could just type in, show me a picture of this person and this person or, or this person with this other person's face? Um, I'm sure possibly one there was, of the listeners. Uh, me, th- I know that there was they had a chat bot where you could ask it to generate the images. drawing. You no, know, it, it no. would like it would like do it, Google image searches and combine stuff mm-hmm. i yeah I, th- I know what you're talking about i don't know if we covered it on this program yeah it was it was pretty lo-fi but uh but this looks like it's just a uh, more of a, of a procedurally generated uh sandbox world of, of whatever you can cook up it'll send you a picture of mm-hmm. and these and these you know aren't like the most uh you look at these you're like yeah i kind of get what it's saying but again these things get better and better and better and then you start training the data sets like I think I'd love for somebody to train this with a comic book data set 
you know, Batman, you know, punching um, Penguin, whatever, you know, yeah, let's yeah. cross boundaries, you know, you know, Batman and Iron Man drinking a beer, you know, and, and we're going to get that. That's the kind of thing that's fascinating is that the things that you can imagine, AI is going to get very good. It'd be like having an artist as your best friend that's willing to draw all those cool comics you wanted in, in school or create movies and experiences. That's so crazy. Yeah. When it picks. Yeah. Uh, uh, do, uh, I'm not late to the party. You're late to the party. I, I know there's a bold stance, but I think documentary now season three is much better than season two. Ah, mm, mm. <laughs> it's uh, getting ca caught up on that. I have a few more to go in season three, but man, um, season two was really a slog. Like at some point they just, yeah. a lot of them felt like once I got the joke, I was like, well, I don't. I don't think it's gonna make me laugh. So I would. I would skip the last twenty minutes of some of them just to go on to the next one. But whereas everything I'm seeing in season three is is they really have bothered to write jokes in there outside of. Isn't this exactly like the thing we're copying? Yeah, I think it, it's it. That show at its best has always been great at not only making the making it a funny journey, but also that you kind of care about the story within it and that the story within it is well told. Uh, there's always something else going on that you are kind of following, and it's not just like, well, if you loved this documentary, like, wait for our Spaceballs version. Uh, and and, and I, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a huge part of season three, that, like, every single one of the episodes has its own little, except for maybe the, the Rent one, but even then, the funny part of that is that they're singing these, like, uh, uh, you know, songs for a musical that doesn't exist. Well, and, and and in that case, it's like it's so outrageous, and I don't want to say bad, but just like like it's it's got that that amazing like wow, these are really talented songwriters writing about a really you know low rent version <laughs> of 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 an established property, uh, and, yeah. and they just bake that into all of the lines, and so it was a real delight to watch. The um. I never saw the uh, f whatever the finding the Calvin and Hobbes guy uh, finding Mr. Watterson. Uh, so the parody of of finding Gary Larson, um, it seemed like it was kind of a scathing indictment of the finding Mr. Watterson, where they're kind of saying that the filmmaker is a piece of garbage. If if they're directly doing that, <laughs> I'm 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 with you. I haven't seen that doc, but uh, either that was uh, their own commentary on just where we are in terms of documentaries uh it's either a scathing indictment on that concept or it's a scathing indictment on that person exactly uh, i i yeah i'm unqualified to weigh an opinion either but i remember watching like the trailer for the one there because they were trying to make one about trying to find chris columbus i mean not chris i mean uh, john hughes you know the, the, yeah. the guy that worked with john hughes there was one about trying to find john hughes and like and the trailer, you watched part of it, and it was like, it felt like they were owed. We were owed this explanation of what happened to this man who disappeared from public life, and we want to go try and find him. And it's like, no, you're not. Yeah. You're not owed an explanation. You, you can make a documentary about his work and whatnot and not insert yourselves in there, you know, and it, and it just, and I, you know, maybe lining the whole thing, but I remember watching the trailer and being turned off by the concept because it's like, this this I deserve to know because my personal journey is so important, you know, and and that's what this was really a great indictment of is these documentaries where, you know, people want to show their own importance, you know, and it's the frustrated filmmaker who finally figures out like, well, I'm going to become the center of, you know, something by putting myself there. Says a guy who may not have a documentary coming out very soon. About <laughs> I, I I will say that man, uh, they 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 front loaded the badass on season three with uh, uh, Backcrap Valley uh, parts one and two, and especially when it took me longer than I'd like to admit to realize that that's Owen Wilson as the guru. It's uh, it's pretty <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, no, I was definitely. It took me a little bit to. I'm like, I know he's someone. Who is? And then as soon as they had like that first like thing with the nose, and I'm like, oh my god, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I, yeah, that one was like that was too long for me compared to the others, but still, it was I, very. Well, I don't know, splitting it into two parts because it's one story and then a big twist at the end, and then it becomes a second yeah. story with more context. I, yeah. I, I liked it better than I liked their other two parters. I think that their their other two parters tend to be like, oh no, we just have a really great 
thing and we're going to tell we're going to split it into two halves like the like the blue jean committee one where it's like that blue jean committee one probably could have been a better one episode thing than it was a two episode at least with with bat crap valley it was uh there was like this very you know the new characters that were heretofore unintroduced like like carried like the michael keaton carries the second one also, uh, a- Fred Armiston, uh, that dude, that dude could speak Spanish, <laughs> and and he he could do accents uh, that good enough to fool the he passed the Turing test on on this guy. Yeah, that's kind of been his bit though forever. Is is the like uh, you know even even going back to like Euro Trip, uh, uh, like he just loves playing people who speak other languages speaking English. <laughs> like that is, that is a, that is well, a big, specifically big thing. I'm thinking about the, uh, uh, whoever Juan likes rice and chicken where, where he just yeah. does the whole thing in Spanish. And it sounds to yeah. me as, as, as passable and authentic as, as, as I'm able to discern. Uh, yeah, no, he was, uh, I mean, he's, he's, a, a great, great, uh, uh, you know, mimic, <clears throat> Uh, he's he's awesome, and I, I think he's really he's really really strong in this uh, this season. Yeah, I met him at a party once. It was after season one, and he was just standing there by himself. I'm like, hey, I don't want to be weird. I don't want to annoy you, but like, Documentary Now is amazing. It's one of my favorite things you've done. I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry. I'm like so appalled. He's like, oh, that's great. No, I like to hear that. It's really cool, you know. And I'm like, yeah. And then that that awkward silence where I'm like, well, I said the thing I wanted to say. Nobody else is here talking to him. Um, I don't want to just turn around and walk away like, hey, I got better things to do. But, you know, you never think about that when you're like, oh, I'm going to go talk to this person. I'm like, how am I going to get out of talking to that person? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's always the move to punch out. And then if they are like reaching, if you're like, anyway, man, I just wanted to say that. If, if then there's another like, oh, really? What was your favorite episode? Then it's like, OK, well, now we're. Now we're talking. We have like converse, consent conversation, uh, but if it's just like the the roll up, then it's like, "Hey man, good job by you." Here I go. Anyway, it's like, it's see a you very later. Small party, so it's like I'm just gonna go stand over here by myself. Yeah. And we'll yeah, be that's a, that's a rough one. That's a high degree of difficulty. Yeah, especially since he's kind of famously sort of anxious. Anyway, like I had this, yeah. I've been doing this thing on on the Jury Daily podcast where I've just been asking people like, all right, if you had like a celebrity, there's like a few celebrities that have kind of like, they're like their own lifestyle brands, like that you like, that you just find them fascinating as people and you would like want them to just be somebody that would like text you every three weeks and be like, hey, I'm doing blank, whatever that blank might be. And I had like, you know, Bill Murray is that for a certain demographic. Jeff Goldblum is that for a certain demographic. There's these people that kind of radiate like a lifestyle. And a bunch of people started writing in about their favorite things, but they were all like people that are famously anxious. And it's like, no, you wouldn't <laughs> want to hang out with that person. Like you'd want to watch their work, but you wouldn't hang out. Like that's that's you know, I don't know. That's super weird. Yeah, that's the expression like you don't want to meet your heroes. There and then there's that, yeah. Is that anybody, even the people that we might think are like, oh, wow, it'd be really cool to, like, go to one. You now, I wonder what, like, underground art museum that I would, if I was hanging out with Jeff Goldblum, he would, uh, that we would go uh, see. And then it's like, no, everyone's probably weird. Yeah. I don't know about him, but, like, yeah, sometimes like, I want to meet so-and-so. And it's like, ah, you don't. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't. Brian Brushwood is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> You hold on. Hey, I'm good to meet you, Brian. He holds on to your hand. He doesn't let go. Like, How are you? <laughs> Have you seen all the episodes of of Modern Rogue? Have you? Have you? What about what about before that? Uh, uh, did you see the precursor, Brian Rushwood on the road? Did uh, yeah. Did you ever did you ever watch any of my old stage show? I did a lecture in 2006. Yeah. <laughs> you ever been to Halloween Horror Nights? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a I don't this maybe it's not for here, but there's a. Uh, there was a story about a Hollywood celebrity that, like, you know, you go to, he invites people to his house, go well over to his house, and he'll, like, play, like, his old movies and stuff for you, you know? And, like, I had that experience of, like, somebody, like, oh, you come hang out, come over, hang out. And it's like, oh, yeah, we're going to watch this thing. And I'm like, um, wow, that's a thing people really do? <laughs> you know? Um, so. And yeah, uh, guys, you should come drop by. I'm gonna, you know, play some of my old, you know, clips <laughs> and stuff. It'll be cool. Be great. 
Um, yeah, man, I'll tell you what. I really don't have a great pick because I've been so drilled in on the debates that happened in the live show. I know your uh, pick. I know your pick. Your pick is uh, uh, your upcoming appearance on a friend of our show. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I wish I knew how to promote it, <laughs> but uh, there is uh, uh, the great and powerful Andrew Heaton, who previously was doing a show called Something's Off with Andrew Heaton. Uh, and uh, I can neither confirm nor deny that tomorrow uh, one Brian Brushwood and myself will be uh, will be uh, recording something with Andrew Heaton. And uh, that may or may not be the first episode of the new chapter of his podcasting career. So I guess, uh, Bryce, what is his Patreon uh, slash Andrew it's, Heaton? Yep. Yes, Andrew Heaton on Patreon. Yeah, patreon.com slash Andrew Heaton. Go ahead and uh, go ahead and get in on it. Very cool. Bryce? Uh, yeah, I got a pick. Uh, so over the weekend, a uh, new video game came out, and it was very cool. I, it was interesting because I think it's a very novel game, but it's also a sequel to uh, an existing game. It's Super Mario Maker 2. I don't know if you mm. guys have any uh, seen anything about this. Uh, I mean, yeah, I assume I about you it. make Mario levels, and, and you can get wacky and creative with it? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, they, they added a lot of new stuff to this game, so they added new, like, background sets they added um night mode so so for example like on the um uh in the sky there's like a sky um uh backdrop you know the clouds version in the night mode uh it's low gravity or in uh, the, uh there's like a uh, the was i think it's in the underground cave gravity is upside down so they're like new twists on um the types of levels you can make they added a bunch of new objects it's very cool and i think even if you're not interested in the actual like making levels uh there's already thousands and thousands of really cool levels that people have made it also has a story mode so you can um uh you you <laughs> the the peach's castle gets uh, exploded and you have to collect coins by doing jobs to uh have the toads rebuild it uh, and it's uh, it's cool. I don't know. I think I think it's been it's a lot of fun. I've made a few levels already, and it's yeah. Didn't you like make a level where Mario goes like and collects unemployment insurance or something? <laughs> no, I I made a new level where Mario Mario goes to the movies, and so you go into town and you go to into a movie theater and you find your right theater, and uh, and it was <laughs> it's fun. It's a very simple like idea, but it lets you do wacky, crazy yeah uh, stuff like that, um, and having having all the tools at your fingertips it, it makes it easy to like oh well you know i can add this or i can do this and move this around um so i think if you have a switch it was it, it was one of the best games for the wii u when the first one came out a few years ago and i think this one is a very solid follow-up it's a worthy sequel to that so uh, i wonder how long until people just make their ports of like unauthorized like uh, other movies oh. like but like like, like reality bites but yeah. it's mario have like, you this is this is a little bit of a tangent but have you guys seen the the game dreams on on ps4 mm -mm. dreams is a very similar thing it's from um the same people who made um a uh, little big planet uh but it's kind of an a similar sort of user creation game where you can make levels but their whole thing is is very in depth, and you can make literally any type of game within it. Um, and it's and people have apparently people have gone through and made. I don't know if it was in Dreams or in Little Big Planet Three, but someone has already gone in and made Super Mario Maker in this Maker wow. game. Wow! <laughs> wow! That's crazy. So and so like the, yeah. the like user generated content as a platform is is very cool and i think the super mario maker one is very accessible to get into uh as b Pfeiffer points out in our chat room is that uh, it's turing complete and that means that basically <laughs> a, any turing machine is a computer that can do basically a, a certain number of you know logical functions mm -hmm. every computer we use is pretty much turing complete and you can simulate another computer on it which means that you know be slower but you can theoretically run you know you know, Windows on a Turing complete system, it might just take you a thousand years to get through the startup sequence. Yeah. Mario is stupid. Mario Maker 2 is Turing complete. You could use it to simulate any other computer system. Yeah. Wow. Um, Magic the Gathering is actually Turing complete as far game? as the card play. How? 
wait, how so? Or, uh, like, as it, far as assuming, if this does this, then it does that. Right. Or, uh, oh, uh, just uh, because it is a system. Yeah. If you I, if you I, I uh, if you can make infinite customizable cards, uh, you can design oh, a version that yeah. because each one is a cycle that interacts uh, uh, with itself. Oh wow. Yeah. Huh, yeah. Wow, so that's, that's a nice. that's a really uh, clever parallel that I wouldn't have thought of. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I have. A, I'm going to do two two picks. Quick pick. One is. Uh, I've been playing my Oculus Quest, still loving it, which, you know, for me is, you know, to have this much of attention span for anything is surprising. Uh, the the latest game I've been having a lot of fun with is, Mal, is Moss, which is on other platforms, too. It's where you control a little mouse running through this sort of fantasy forest environment, solving puzzles and stuff. And what's cool about this is it's instead of you doing first person as the mouse, it's like a conventional sort of game where you're controlling, you know, the character running around. But because it's in 3D virtual reality, you're looking at these dioramas and sort of leaning in and helping her, you know, jump over, navigate things and solve problems. And the gameplay, I'm several hours into it. It's been a lot of fun. You know, I'm not a I'm not like a run around and shoot at things kind of for, like, you know, I have Space Pirate Trainer, which is cool. But I'm like, all right, I'm bored where well, this is sort of fun and engaging in the graphics, you know, on the quest. You know, they're not as detailed as you're going to get on the PC version, but are really amazing. And it's neat because you, you look at this sort of like. You know, she enters this sort of like underground cavern with, you know, vines and stone structures and stuff like this. And then you just lean your head into the scene and you can look all around and go, oh, there's the scroll I need to find. So, Moss is a fun game. I think I know it's on the quest. I think it's probably available on, you know, probably on Vive 2 and probably uh, the Rift, et cetera. So yeah. nice. Cool. Uh, my other pick is, uh, man, like. When it comes to crazy personalities and you hear that they're when you hear they're making like, oh, they're going to do a TV show or a movie about some people, you go like, oh, they're going to have to make up a bunch of stuff to make it interesting. Sometimes you hear that about somebody you go like, oh, man, uh, I hope they have enough time to tell everything about this person because they're so weird. Um, Strange Angel, the story of Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons is the pioneering rocket chemist who helped develop a lot of the technologies that went to go into the American, you know, uh, basically space program. He got his start in the 1930s to work with some other people at Caltech. He wasn't actually a Caltech scientist. He was a hobbyist chemist and uh, loved to make things explode. Eventually, the Caltech said, you know what? We probably can't have you guys on campus. We're going to move you off location to some other place. And that became JPL. JPL Laboratory is actually the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, may have got the initials JP from Jack Parsons because he is that kind of guy. Of course, like, oh, that's fascinating. Like, oh, yeah, he was also an occultist into Satan worship, used to live with well Ron Hubbard, and uh, was into some very, very weird stuff. I oh, mean, that's amazing. You know, yeah. Follower of Aleister Crowley. The, the series is based loosely on the book Strange Angel. They incorporate, you know, understand, 1930s was a big time for science fiction stuff, and this is a guy who is prone to sort of flights of fancy and imagination. And I think they do a wonderful job of doing this. The, 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 the series opens them up with... With basically, you're watching a scene from some pulp magazine that he's reading, and you, and it's not forced to me, you know. Like there's another episode where H.G. Uh, Wells' War of the Worlds is playing, and he periodically, when he comes to a setback, sort of ima stops to imagine the tripods blowing stuff up. And it, it's not like a Walter Mitty. It's just to show you this guy's got one his mind is half in the future in the world of fantasy because of the world he wants to make. You know, he wants to build rockets because he wants us to go to the moon. You know. So, Strange Angel. It's on CBS All Access. Right on. Cool. Dope. All right, everybody. Um, it's been weird. Hey. It's been yeah. Weird. All right. Uh, anybody need to take a break? Uh, yeah, I, I gotta. I gotta do a break. I'll okay. be right back. Go for it. Uh, 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 um. Um. So I don't know whether or not it makes sense, but I, I, at some point I'm gonna have to find a platform to express my frustrations with the most recent episode of Handmaid's Tale. Oh really? <laughs> I mean, look, you should come on Court Killers and talk about it sometime. All I want to say is this: there are moments that frustrate me with that show greatly. There are moments that I enjoy, and I think the promise of that show is something that is really cool because there's not a lot of you know, alternate history, uh, you know, kind of uh, what uh, ifs. 
world building fiction kind of stuff, right? I also think that that's a it, it is it is a ripe idea and it's a decent universe. But like, oh my god, was the most recent episode like bad fad fan fiction? Oh, like really? if I were if I were to say what denotes bad fan fiction, mm -hmm. it would be an over reliance on certain relationships like like all right so if you're gonna read a bad fan fiction it'd be like oh uh, uh and now we're gonna do more about how uh, uh these two characters don't like each other or yeah. like more about like they're, they're gonna play the hits that really? they know because they've liked it yeah. before right drilling into existing kind of understood character relationships sure um instead of evolving them number two okay. doing things that could be clever with literally no subtlety now look handmaid's tale is not a show with a lot of subtlety no. so when you do things like that without subtlety mm -hmm. you get things like a shocked protagonist rolling into washington dc to find that the washington monument has been turned into a cross <laughs> which like <laughs> <laughs> Number one, it is just the most Handmaid's Tale of all Handmaid's Tale, like, things to do, yeah. right? Just, like, how can we, in the least subtle way, show that we have, that America has been taken over by a theocracy? Oh, I know the first thing that they would do is turn the Washington Monument into a cross. <laughs> but beyond that, how is it a surprise? Like, like at some point, we think, was there no? Did they never? I mean, you'd figure, even if they were going to do that, mm -hmm. that would be a thing like, ah, finally, like we have washed the secular past of this nation away and we've truly brought the Lord into our life. But it's like, oh, oh my God, this is a thing. <laughs> How far we've we fallen. And yeah. there's other stuff in there that is also like, it's it just, it's everything that you could think the that the, the character would react it's that times mm. stupid like it, it is it is like oh god i i don't know at this point like i i have i have long flirted with like all right it's an imperfect show and there are things that i like about it and there are things that genuinely frustrate me and then i feel like that episode put me right into like no i am hate watching this show uh. this is it's no longer like me, I'm I I I feel uh, a righteous hate for this program, and and that's why I'm going to well that and also because it's one of the shows that Ashley wants to watch. So <laughs> wait, wait, which one? Which no one is it? sympathy out of me, man. And yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not saying I want sympathy. I'm just saying it was remarkable how fan fictiony it was. I it went just, to a was... church. And man, it was preachy. <laughs> it's not, again, it's not that it's preachy. I know that they're going to hit these notes. Yeah. It's just like, I, the thing I always said that, that they have always had that I will always enjoy is that I like their creepy world building rituals. I like the creepy world building rituals. I always feel like those are interesting ways. Although also they, they've kind of dropped the fact that like the premise that they got into the entire thing of the show was that women couldn't give birth to children and that's what brings apart brings up all this like crazy cultural stuff mm -hmm. which i realized and we're into the you know we're now six episodes into the third season i looked at ashley and i'm like hey have they ever picked up on that like is that still going or was that a thing that happened that then it rebounded and women were able to have kids again because well, they've definitely why... That's not touched upon like any kind of continuing scientific population curve hmm. uh, of stuff since they kind of set up how everything wound up coming to be. Uh, look, I like the rituals. I like that, that there are times in their world building that I think they, that they can do very clever things. Making the Washington Monument into a cross is maybe the largest sign that the well has run dry. Well, that was in the, I don't, I, I think, uh, I never finished the first season, but uh, I think that's in the episode art for three season three, because I saw that image. Yeah, uh, no, I'm, I'm it, now that you mentioned, I think it's in the little, um, the little like clip that they'll show is like, the, it's the end of this most recent season, or this most recent episode where there, it's a big demonstration, and the 
the camera pans. Out. Oh, by the way, they've also ripped out Abraham Lincoln, and it looks like that they might have shot Abraham Lincoln in the head. Like they might have shot the Lincoln Mon the Lincoln Monument in the head because it, Lincoln has been ripped out, but he's still kind of like his arms are still there. So but then there's like, also a gigantic it, like indent behind where his head would be. So I'm like. Did they shoot him in the head? Like, did they get a giant John Wilkes Booth statue to go? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, uh, they uh, and, and like, the, just... like, like the like the cowboy in Vegas. Like, it's just John Wilkes Booth, like slowly moving the gun up. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, uh, Justin, did you guys need a break? No. Uh, I'm fine. You good? good? Yeah. Check out uh, Justin's podcast on uh, hating Handmaid's Tale on ThinkSpot. So catch it. Yeah, no, uh, go ahead and check out my gab account where I'm gonna <laughs> do my full handmaid's tale uh, uh tear down. Call it catch these handmaids. <laughs> Gilead. Good idea? Maybe so. Okay. Yeah. Oh, 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 man. There's well just... like here's here's the thing about like when I said the cross you're commenting that like like ah look at this religious iconography over this. I'm like, how are people in Brazil looking at this going like well, you know, looking up their statue of Jesus looming over the entire city, going, oh, "Yeah, no. okay, you know." C certainly shut that party down. Now I really want to find out how feasible it would be to turn the Washington Monument into a cross. Actually, I will be right back. Um. Oh my God, what? Although Christopher Maloney's in it, yeah. Yeah. They also added, uh, what's his name, from the West Wing. Yeah, and his character, I, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. they, they really, really, really love edging around this concept of, like, there's a resistance inside this dystopic world. Mm -hmm. And they keep introducing you to pieces, and then the pieces uh, then say, hmm, well, I could do the most interesting thing for the meta Like, what the hell is <laughs> happening? Why? Definitely mean, looks like he's just been blown away. Exactly. Then they shot him in the head. And she's just making this like, what is... Oh, my God. Oh, no, she hugs him. She hugs... That's that scene. The scene is she's hugging him. I mean, again, it's oh my the God. most... <laughs> uh, okay. I couldn't stop laughing. I could not <laughs> stop laughing. And it's like a big moment in the mm. show. It's an emotional moment. And Ashley's like, why are you laughing? And I'm like, I can't believe. Like, they did it. They finally went full Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> They've achieved their destiny. Uh, you know what I found myself accidentally finishing was um, the new Netflix How to Sell Drugs Online Fast. Have you guys seen, like, a trailer for this or anything? Mm -mm. Yeah. It's a German show, and it's about a kid who uh, en ends up buying a big bag of um, of of, uh, of Molly, and uh, creates. He's he's working on with his friend on this gamer service where you can sell each other items. It's like an online gaming marketplace, and they turn that into a dark web drugs website um and so it's kind of it's a little it's a little like hijinksy in terms of just like you know now we got to sell drugs yeah uh, and I'm also sorry, my Bryce, dad's a new cop business new business you're working on i just jumped in here <laughs> <laughs> uh but it was only six episodes it was, it was actually pretty good and the english i watched it only with the english dub uh and i think it worked i think it worked honestly i've been i've been enjoying the english like um the other that, that French show Osmosis about the people who take a pill to find their soulmate and computers determine it. Uh, I think that English dub was okay too. Anyway, good talk. Good talk, <laughs> everybody. <guys>. Fun times. <laughs> All right, you guys want to do after things? Yeah. All right. Whenever you're ready. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello, everybody. It's me, Brian Brushwood. Yo, Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. You know what I thought we could talk about here is uh, our motivation techniques. Mine are imperfect; they don't always work, but I have some that sometimes work, and maybe they'd be helpful to other people. You know, I'm in the middle of trying to finish a novel, and sometimes it goes really well. 
sometimes I just sit around all day thinking about what I need to do. <laughs> but what I found works best is there being mentally prepared, like being psychologically ready to do it and then having everything I need to do it. Now, for me to write a book, to do it, I need an outline. I need a pretty good chapter breakdown where I know what the conflict is. So when I sit down to write, I have a clear idea. This is what the characters are trying to accomplish. If it's just an info dump, if it's just like this happens, not as good for me. And I, it takes me longer to write it. Psychologically or to get myself ready, one of my little things I do is when it's time for me to write, one is I get very comfortable. Like I'm wearing jeans. I'll actually wear like loose shorts. Uh, which probably means I'm like pre-diabetes or something. I don't know. But anyhow, I try to get very comfortable. I have my noise-canceling headphones if I need them, which right here, I highly recommend those. I have a soundtrack I listen to, uh, instrumental music, movie to move music, whatever, that I play that just sort of helps me zone out everything else out around me. And then for a little bit of energy, I go drink a uh, like a fruit smoothie. I get one of those like uh, you know from the store, just like the the fruit juice and pulp sort of things. And I drink maybe six or eight ounces of that, and I find that energy wise, my energy levels go up because of course my you know the fruit sugars are in me peak. And I sit down to write, and it works out really well. So. And that's my little routine. And so that that is something where you are definitely you're in front of a computer like this is of uh, 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 you just you know, having to force yourself to mm -hmm. go and make progress every day to make sure that you're doing work that you don't, you're not going to wind up wanting to go back and, and change. But good quality stuff that is advancing the ball down down the field uh, uh, that those are those are all the, the, the prep things. Yeah, and I would say, I would say that's when it's when it's hey it's time to write and get motivated. The big trigger for me, the motivated is like I need to go do this, is that go drink that fruit smoothie, go drink a little bit of that fruit juice, have my music to sort of distract me from everything else around me, and then sit down and get in the zone. And you know I'm you know I've talked about this before. Like, I'm a big believer like don't get too precious about these things. Like you know I'll write on my iPhone, standing in line at a movie theater if I need to. Like I, I'm a big believer like just get it done but if i'm trying if i'm feeling like just lethargic and no inertia this works best for me this is the thing that gets me out of bed this is the thing that gets me to go work is to just sort of have that you know get the fruit juice get the music sit down and just go at it how about you guys a uh, little thing I like to call deadlines, uh, yeah. do or die moments constantly coming at you and, 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 oh crap, I'm really screwed if I don't get this done or if I don't, you know, I, I don't know something about, um, uh, what's funny is your whole routine is about getting comfortable to become productive. And I have found uh, I'm the res reverse. I, I don't seem to get productive unless I'm deeply uncomfortable and looking at massive more discomfort. And then it's like, uh, okay, it's time. And, and in fact, that goes back even to the stage shows where the way I got good is by committing to a certain open mic night, getting myself on, on the schedule or whatever, having a cast in stone that I needed to figure out these problems that I knew with the routine beforehand. And then, you know, it would get closer and closer and closer and you get to that do or die moment. And then all of a sudden, I don't know. That's when inspiration uh, hits. You know, my dad used to tell me nothing inspires creativity like a deadline. And so, uh, you know, most of my career has been s spent trying to put myself in a position where I got to get stuff figured out. <laughs> if not at the last minute, then at least knowing a last minute is coming so I can steep and percolate on it so that, you know, at a subconscious level, you're thinking through all the logistical problems, and then finally it comes to snap judgment, make a decision mode, and you're able to get stuff done. I I hear you. Like I have a deadline right now, but the problem is that the deadline is still like over a month away, and I will wait. Normally, I will wait until I'm like two weeks out, and then I'll get it done because the deadline's there. But I'm like, yeah, if I wait. I'm not going to get these other things I want done. And that's been the thing I've been trying to juggle is to get out of the, the you know, coming from an entertaining role, you know, performing role too, is I get that. I had anxiety attacks about not having my magic show ready for years, you know, and I'm a big believer, like throw your hat over the fence and create this deadline that's impending upon you. And, you know, now in the publishing world, I have very, very, very real deadlines, but I'm like, I have all these other things I want to do. And if I procrastinate too much, if I play too many video games and do this stuff, I don't get to do those other things. And I've been trying to figure out ways to like, just get it done, you know, from just entirely through internal motivation. 
Yeah, you know, it, I had a, a live show this week, and I had kind of thrown my hat over the wall a few, maybe probably two months ago, to do it uh, as like a, a presentation of me making jokes about the debates that happened, right? Uh, and on one hand, it was great because I didn't have to worry for many, many weeks about uh, rehearsing or writing or doing anything because I just knew that it was everything was going to kind of come down in this uh, a very short period of time, and I had to get something stage ready in a a you know fairly quick turnaround, a very quick turnaround. But part of that, you know, in general, I guess to kind of break it down to the essence in terms of motivation, the 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 dream is creating deadlines in your head that you are going to honor, right? Is being able to harness what Brian's talking about, about the like, okay, I need to be, I'm, I'm going to only be more uncomfortable if I don't get this done now. Uh, at least for me, it's like, okay, well, how can I make that in my own head? How can I, how can I, can I summon that in, 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 in any way? And then beyond that, like Andrew said, in terms of like knowing what I need so I can maximize the time that I am putting in, uh, I have to be smarter about exactly how I'm going about uh, doing everything. So it's like for for this show, uh, the the big thing that ultimately wound up being very helpful was that instead of just saying to myself, all right, I'm going to watch these debates again, take down all my notes of what I want, the, the clips I want, the funny moments, uh, wa uh, and then editing all the little clips out, that I would take as detailed a notes as I could while I was live streaming my reactions initially uh, and kind of soft build the show uh, uh, even as I am just like watching it, just just to to kind of A, keep it fresh and, and have a, a little bit of a better idea of like what I want to talk about. Now, I then went and pulled those clips on Friday and I'm like, okay, well, some of these jokes aren't as funny as I thought in the moment. Uh, uh, some of them really do work. And and that was it, it. I was very happy that Friday became an editing process as opposed to a creation process. And that's something that I had to learn, um, you know, after, after a while, because, you know, there's always for me, man, there's no amount of work that uh, I, I can't put on future me's uh, plate. Like, oh man, do I love that future me? Always oh, a hard worker, not not like present me. Like I deserve a break, so let me go ahead and do stuff like that. But uh, being able to take a little bit of that eye off the ball of the live stream and give myself a roadmap as it was happening wound up being huge, and I think it, it contributed to the show going well. Uh, all three, yeah, all I know four of us. Uh, all four of us. Do we all work out of the home generally? I know we shoot out out. Out, out in the studio, field, yeah. But, um, like Andrew and Justin, you guys also mm -hmm. all just kind of work in in your apartments. I, I tend not to outline here. Like, I'll if I need to do outlines, like I have a stack of note cards, and I'll go somewhere to go do that. Um, although lately, like I've been doing more outlining here because just time constraint. Um, but yeah, I work from home, and you know, and that's the problem because home is where we have all the other distractions. Yeah. Um, and, I I remember reading an interview with the uh, this. Japanese music producer who's been doing it for probably 20, 25 years now. And over over the past few decades, he's written literally hundreds of songs, right? He's worked with a bunch of groups and just bangs out tons of songs constantly. And I remember in the interview, he, you know, they were asking him, like, how do you, you know, how do you come up with, you know, all these lyrics and all these, you know, basic compositions for these songs? And he, he, you know, he said, I go into an office and I sit down and I have the set amount of time that I'm working on writing music. And that's the time when I'm writing music. And I think I think having that external location, right, somewhere where it's not just, you know, a couple of feet away, even in a home office room, but it's somewhere you got to walk to or drive to um, really, re really gets you motivated to to be working and and even you know good stuff bad stuff it gets you it gets you going because you're not 
at home surrounded by distractions. Well, and, and weirdly, uh, this is, we're talking about productivity, but, but it's also true on the exact opposite. Uh, when it comes to establishing healthy sleep patterns, they say one thing is your bed is for sleeping, uh, possibly one other activity, but nothing else. It's not for hanging out and it's not for looking at your cell phone. It's not for, you know, uh, playing video games in. Uh, mm -hmm. Because your body, your body responds to all of those those cues. Yeah. Uh, when like when when everything about your surroundings says this is the workplace, this is the place where working happens, then you mm -hmm. tend to snap to and just be like, well, engage subroutine, uh, accomplish work, and then uh, and likewise, you know, this is the sleep place. This is where the world goes away. Yeah. Man, you want to know what the funniest thing is? Is like so we set up this entire studio here. Uh, uh, we moved our bed out of what was our bedroom and now we have a Murphy bed in our living room. So we sleep in our living room uh, and then we have this entire studio and it's two computers and, and all sorts. I could literally set the lights to anything I possibly want to be the most productive that I could be. And I can't get work done here. Like mm -hmm. I, I have found myself that like, this is a performance spot. This is a spot where I can interact with the show. I can, I can record podcasts, but in general, I oftentimes in my head uh, associate this with, all right, I'm live streaming and now I'm done live streaming. So what do I immediately do? Just try to not focus on being on and screw around on the internet and like immediately get on Reddit, immediately get on Twitter, immediately read through all the other stuff that I need to read through. And some of that stuff I can justify more than others. I can say, oh, well, if I'm reading about politics, then I'm actually doing my job right now. But when uh, uh, John Teasdale moved down to San Diego, he had a standing desk that he was getting rid of. We got it, and now I can work on the standing desk in my living room. So now, like, I can write better there because that's my writing place. I, I don't screw around as much when I'm on that desk because that's where every morning I wake up, get breakfast, sit down, answer emails and like prep the newsletter for for later in the day. And I can be a lot more efficient writing everything that I then come in here and perform. It's so weird. Mm -hmm. it, it's but, you know, it's my my workspace here, which is really a you know, performance space, only a couple hours a week, unlike yours. Um, there is no instant messenger on my my computer. If I wanted to use Facebook, I'd have to go find a password to go log on to it because it's not going to automatically log on. I have no iMessage. Uh, Skype gets shut down after this podcast is over and isn't open until next week. All notifications are turned off. Yeah. You know, um, and so this is and the problem is, is, you know, like I mean, like all of us and I think different than the composer examples, we all wear so many hats. And, and sometimes, you know, a there's do I need to work on this project, which is what's going to pay me or do I need to this work project work on this project, which I hope will pay me next year. And, you know, the balance between those can be problematic. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Any any advice, Bryce? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the, this is I, there is like you have to kind of give stuff priorities which like a lot of the stuff that you know i do for ryan is like it's a lot of deadline based stuff so that makes it very structured like mondays i'm working on these podcasts until late at night tuesdays i'm getting ready for night attack or possibly getting ready for something else in the week wednesdays i'm editing for scam nation uh, uh thursdays if we don't have a shoot i'm either trying to get caught up on like uh like admin stuff uh you know weekends are shoots um, and, and so that, that routine, um, having, having had it for a while, you, you understand where to fit stuff in best. And so even though we have like auxiliary podcasts, like we have the bizarre briefing, which we only do once a month, I have trending lemon, which I do every week and, uh, you know, finding spots to fit those in, um, is, is, is part of that 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 queuing process and making making sure that there is time within the week to fit in stuff like that or like the like the twitch stream stuff right to to engage with the community um yeah as far as like so so for for me that 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 priority list is is very much time based because everything kind of needs to get done um but that's a more rigid structure than than probably you or justin have well i mean the 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 issue i do like 
like with publishing deadlines, I've always met them and I've always been very happy with what, but I've always thought like, man, if I finished this thing a month or before, I would have loved more time to make it even better. You know, and that's been my problem is that like, you know, in the book world, you turn the thing in and you, you get to, you get an opportunity to tweak it later on. But the thing you kind of turn in is sort of the thing you turn in and, and you have that, oh man, I wish I did this. I wish I did that. And if I'm too wait for the deadlines, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm, I've got two books due this summer, right? And like, like I'm excited, but I'm also know that this is the point at which if I'm going to fail, this is where I'm going to fail. If I'm going to turn into a hack, this is where it's going to happen. Yeah. And I don't want that to happen. You know, I want to put more effort because I noticed a lot of light writers as they, they're at that point where they can get comfortable, like, ah, I got book deals and stuff. I know what I'm doing and I can just go on autopilot. And that's when people nosedive. And I'm like, I don't want that. I want my stuff to go better. You, so. I know that you send stuff off to friends to kind of look at. Have you ever put your put that on a deadline and say, hey, on this day, I'm going to send you a file. If I don't send you a file, ask me about it to, to take a look. So that way you have mm-hmm. a sort kind of soft deadline, but you have created an obligation with somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I have I mean, I have a deadline, you know, for one project because like I've got to go in, you know, a little over a week, go meet with like my publishers. And so I want to be able to say it's done. You know, it's not due, but I want to be able to say that it's done because yeah. I don't want to meet with them and be like, how's it going? And be like, oh, it's coming, you know, it's going to, you know, you know. Um, and I've, I've been very, I, I've been very lucky that like, you know, I've got like concurrent publishing deals with the same publisher because I've been delivering on time. Like, like I don't, most authors, you know, I understand actually when they do publishing, you know, publishers do publishing deals, they often figure out, well, this is the deadline we'll give them, but we know it'll take longer. And I'm like, no, a deadline's a deadline. Like you tell me to get this done. It'll get done. If I get the flu or something like this, I'll call you and say, okay, I need five more days, but I'm not going to ask for a month or two month extension or I'm never just, that's just not my nature. And and because of my reputation for that, I've been afforded more opportunities. Well, and and that is one of those things where it's like, you understand that there is a value, uh, a, a sort of a mental real estate value that you know for a fact that you are in the not a problem category in this publisher's yep. mind. And so if you say, yeah, I can get you to, then then you know that you're sacrificing that position in their in their headspace if you don't deliver. Yeah. And I had I went through when I first, you know, worked with my agent, I said, Hey, I'm high output. I can turn these things around. Oh, I, you know, you know, like because I remember like, oh, like I had a, my first deal was like a year to turn in a book. Is that a problem for you? I'm like, a year? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, what am I going to do for the other 50 weeks, you know? And so, you know, because it's the way the way I operate, you know, but uh and then with publishers like, oh, and then once they saw like, oh, no, he just he delivers on time and it's good and their and the reviews are consistently getting good or better, you know, but that's just I don't know. I I guess points like, yeah, that's that's created a lot of opportunity for me and like now I'm like, yeah, don't screw this up because if I screw this up, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know? Mm-hmm. I'm gonna yeah. go put together my college magic show. Brian, <laughs> teach me how to eat fire. <laughs> hey, well, I got uh, all the props. I can, I can license it out to you. How do you feel about spiking your hair? <laughs> sure. <laughs> now I really just want to see Andrew with the spikes. Oh my god! I never thought of that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess it's helpful. Any, any suggestions, motivational books, things like this that have helped you? Anybody? Uh, I mean, any, any, any book on motivation will give you some amount of rocket fuel to go out there and punch the world in the face. If for nothing else, especially audiobooks sort of trap you in a, a virtuous cycle of visualizing all the things you want to accomplish. And then, you know, that, that gives you a, a little bit of a boost to get started. Brian, I'm, I'm going to stop right there. Brian needs to write the book, if anything, because of his aphorisms. Anything that gives you the rocket fuel to punch the world in the face. <laughs> like, 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 Punching the World in the Face by Brian Brushwood. A guide to getting rocket fuel. I mean, like, that's... How to steal it, fire uh, from the gods. Brian Brushwood's motivational book would set the world record for metaphors per capita. <laughs> <laughs> like, there would be no doubt this would be jam-packed with so many metaphors, like, it will uh, uh, make your head spin. It's the Super Bowl. You're on the first yard line. There's 10 seconds left in the game, and the crowd is filled with nanobots living in their eyeballs. How many turquoise uh, gems are you going to put on your necklace? 
Yeah. High or, five. Or, or, or. <laughs> you know, every day you're like, do I collect gold coins or do I jump up in the air and bounce my head against the box and find out what's inside? <laughs> Meanwhile, I dodge those, you know, carnivorous plants, you know, like you just don't know. <laughs> oh, um, hey, man, I got a, I got a fun pick. What's your fun pick? Fun well, I, I got I got a silly short one and then a serious funny one. Serious funny? A, a real one. Uh, <laughs> the silly short one was I, I tweeted it out because I hadn't seen it. And I understand. Look, not everyone sees the same thing at the same time. So maybe you guys have already seen it. But if you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor. Buckle in for a six-minute tour de force by watching a series of Japanese commercials called Long, Long Man. It, uh, it they get increasingly bizarre it's for some Japanese candy and uh, uh, each one is like 20 seconds long and at the end of six oh, minutes yeah. I feel like I watched a whole season of a TV show it's amazing yeah this was a campaign for a, a stretchy like gummy candy yeah it's, and it's, it's like an epic it's like it follows this man who, who, trying to win his girl back yeah well right? they they <laughs> and the guys guys got a girl and she thinks he's super cute but then she sees a guy with a longer gummy strip called long long man and she loses her mind <laughs> and uh and it just keeps on going for there the whole thing has a whole narrative to it and it's really fun and funny uh the um uh the 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 real pick i guess would be i'm finally going back and watching the rest of what we do in the shadows the tv show on fx based on the movie of the same name uh i don't suppose any of you gentlemen have watched any of these have you not mm -hmm. yet I've not way yet, no. good way way good and I, I don't know if it will entice you. I, I never know if it's better to 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 explain one of the things that they do later on. But but I'm I'm all on board. Like ever I think the Vampire Council. All this I'm on board. As oh so so yeah. So you know about the Vampire Council scene. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I I Jason uh, didn't tell me what was special about the Vampire Council scene. But when we got to that, I was like. Oh my! Where and and where it becomes super meta and everything is so great. It's it's great. Yeah, I'm 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 a, I'm on board. I just that that time. <laughs> no. uh, I got a pick. <laughs> I got an after things pick. Uh, we've been watching this for Cord Killers at CordKillers.com, and uh, uh, I was really taken by how good the makeup design was in this third episode that we watched of Chernobyl. Uh, yeah. I am man. Yeah, those miners really did look naked, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a, that was our amazing body yeah, suits. So. <laughs> also, yes. Uh, I, I, you know, it's it's obviously a very tragic, a very uh, awful story. Um, but I I've been really taken away with kind of seeing all of the elements. We we watched episode three for Cord Killers this week, and it starts to get away from the like we've got to solve the problems now into how did this happen. And some of the very dark overtones of like, hey, let's figure out how deep how, di how deep we want to dig into this. Thing. Let's also take a brief moment to stare right in the face of what it looks like to die from radiation exposure. Jeez Louise. Yeah, they, that's some grisly stuff. They really show you the last days of, uh, of some of those poor firefighters. So uh, I think if you have the chance to uh, really check out Chernobyl on HBO, HBO Now, uh, it's good it's good man i think it's good yeah it's it's really good and it's really it's a great starting point afterwards go mm -hmm. look up what they got right what they got wrong and and kind of you know use it as a starting point to sort of explore you know i think that issue sure. you know it's, it's just uh by itself you will not come away knowing any more about nuclear radiation than you did before watching it but after watching it and then looking online and other stuff you'll start to get a grasp like okay they made this part up but this is an issue they made this part up but this is interesting you know yeah yeah so. um i gotta pick that kind of actually plugs into our motivation and and uh keep keeping yourself focused uh a guest on weird things a previous guest on weird things uh aubrey citizen has a new book out called uh no one left to fight it's a dark horse comics an original concept uh, uh from him that basically uh, uh lets him play in the world of uh, a, a, a dragon ball z-esque kind of universe that uh, uh will eventually become a large fighting tournament i guess as the story goes on uh, i read the first issue today it uh, it's awesome if you certainly like professional wrestling or uh 
of Dragon Ball Z, then you're really much going to you're, you're very much going to enjoy it. But you know, Aubrey is somebody that I, I've always appreciated his his work ethic. Um, but you know, a, a couple I mean, maybe it was a year ago uh, or or a year and a half ago, he was uh, got a big break writing for uh, a GI Joe comic, and you know, was on Twitter shooting his mouth off one day, said something stupid. It became a gigantic thing. It became an issue about whether or not he was going to get fired uh, from the book. That didn't happen, but eventually he wasn't brought back on another thing. Cobra Commander had a lot of really good ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, uh, it, it's it's beyond all that. You know, he, he made a point to say, like, all right, look, uh, uh, I had first – he'd first come on my radar not as a comic book author but rather as a, a professional wrestling commentator with a podcast – I liked his podcast, so that's how we wound up, you know, coming into our, each other's world. But, like, he dropped doing that, even though we enjoyed it. Uh, he significantly cut back on the time he was spending on social media. And pretty much now, everything that he does on social media, on some level, plugs back into what he is doing. Either as a creator, or there's a lot more tweets about how... He, uh, you know, is like getting up every day and calling personally comic book shops uh, uh, around the country to see to make sure that they're aware of the title and that they're that they're calling their distributor to do it. Uh, uh, his career has skyrocketed with, with the original stuff. You know, he did the the comic book of professional wrestling, which has, you know, since then been kind of lauded by people, uh, fans and practitioners of pro wrestling alike. And uh, uh, this, I'm sure, is going to be a, a big success with, obviously, a, a big publisher in Dark Horse. So a mm -hmm. big shout out to Aubrey Citizen. Uh, I'm super pumped uh, to, to see him uh, get a project like this, an original work, um, you know, uh, the, this far. And I think uh, to underline the lessons of this entire episode, just clear, clear the mechanism. Focus on what, <laughs> on, on what you want to do. You'd be amazed at how far you can go. If, uh, you know, you are you are you know making some decisions in your own life to say, how do we make it bigger? How do we make it better? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, excited. To, I'd like to look more into that. Um, I love comics. Uh, I am. Uh, oh, yeah, big... oh, yeah. that, 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 first, that, that first issue is up on Comicsology. I think it comes out in two days, but you can find the link on my Twitter at Justin R. Young. Very cool. Um, Dark Horse was always such a cool brand. Like they did like the Alien versus Predator, and I mean the Alien series. Remember the Alien run they did that, and the Star Wars runs they did was cool and whatnot. Like I always thought Dark Horses did some cool stuff. You know, like just more grown up sort of themes on stuff. Um, uh, last uh, the season, the Richest Man in Babylon. You know, we've mentioned this book before, but you know, and and I think we, I think I know Brian and I both sort of like one part of the thing we really liked was the whole. Uh, the expression about the guy talking about walking across the bridge and committing to throw a pebble off every day. And so richest man in Babylon was just one of many books that came out in the early part of the 20th century. that were these motivational books because you had a lot of people looking at the world succeeding. And, you know, when the stock market went up, people wanted to be successful. When it went down, people wanted to pull themselves out of poverty. And there was a lot of hype, a lot of stuff, but some things survived out of there. There were some books that were written that were actually pretty good, you know, and, uh, you know, how to win friends and influence people is certainly from that era. And Richest Man in Babylon's written as if it were a parable from the time of Babylon. And it's about these men who go to the richest man in Babylon to find out how he became wealthy. And it's just basic, just basic advice clothed in the story of as if it were, you know, this historical document. And it's, there's a lot of really, you know, the stuff about, Willpower was a really big topic in the early part of the 20th century. The idea of what makes one person motivated versus somebody who doesn't, and and I think that if you want to figure out what the the biggest predictor for success is, somebody's ability to uh, basically demonstrate what we perceive to be willpower. Somebody who says a thing one day and the next day gets it done. I think that's what separates the Jeff Bezoses and Elon Musks from you know, a lot of other people is that I'm going to go do this thing and then they're doing it while other people talk about it. So, you know, mm. my pick. Cool. Oh. All right. It's been after. Hey, there we go. All righty. 
Well, that's going to do it for us here at the Weird Things and After Things programs. Yeah. We'll be back in a few hours with Cord Killers. Do, uh, do we have a special guest for Cord Killers today? Steve Wilkinson. Oh, right on. Of course, from, yeah. Uh, home uh, Theater Geeks. Theater Geeks. That's right. Home Theater Geeks. Uh, Justin, you got a stream coming up today? No stream. Um, I'm going to be working on... Uh, oh, man. I don't think I can say. Oh. Um, and, okay. I yeah. can tell you guys after we're done. But, uh, <laughs> Please do. It's in, it's in it's in the board game world. Oh, oh, nice. Oh, is this the thing you're working on for the CIA to help teach? Shh. Oh. No, no, no. Shh. Yeah, no, we can't say, but it's... I mean, I mean idiot, Andrew, it's the NSA. <laughs> I was trying to be covert. Oh, crap. All right. Shoot. Well, Jesus. Now my handlers at the FBI are going to be furious. <laughs> uh, Andrew, okay. you playing any, any, any Periscopes? coming up um i am for? not gonna do periscope until i finish this book uh i am gonna go at uh approximately sometime after 11 p.m tonight i'm going to hop into the vehicle with my lady friend we are going to drive to burbank and we are going to present our passes and go see spider-man uh far from home Ooh. oh, oh is that very nice tonight and well yes tonight that's He's a really thing that's that's uh, early. Are they are they doing like a crazy Tuesday release or something? Are they trying to get like a, a mega week long? Uh, I don't opening weekend? know this, but there is a holiday in the middle of this week. Which oh means, yeah, 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 that makes sense. Okay, yeah. I mean, uh, I know you, know, you as Austin, you know the the Berkeley of the South, just don't care. But <laughs> uh, yeah, they're doing. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the reviews, but uh, it's supposed to be good. Pretty delightful. Yeah, so. reviews are great. Uh, I'm I'm pumped. Yeah, I'm pumped to see good reviews for Stranger Things season three too. Oh really? Oh nice. Yeah, which I'm very glad to hear about because I I got a whiff of some of the twists of this season and I was excited to mm -hmm. I was excited about where it would take the show and then the trailer showed like if I didn't know that there was a twist to this season, uh, and I saw the trailer. I would just be like, <sighs> mm, bad Netflix trailer. Same thing again. Really? Is that what we're doing? Bad Netflix. But uh, but the reviews have have uh, buoyed my hopes. Holy cow! Uh, Legion season three has ninety four percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, oh. That is up from well, season two got ninety percent, which I don't know how that happened. <laughs> we gotta finish season two someday. Season two. I mean, is look, we know everybody knows what you're getting with Legion at this point. Like Legion, Legion has long since uh, shed uh, its hope of coherence for me, and it's just like, all right, just make the dance numbers fun. Yeah, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever we're doing, I'm I'm here for your crazy world, Mister. Like, just whatever crazy thing you're doing, just at least make it well executed. And it's the final season, so an excuse to go all yeah. out. All righty. Well, that's going to do it for us, everybody. Thank you very much for listening, watching. Bye-bye. We'll oh, that's not what I want. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.